Now we're going to look at the start of our processes module, session one, part one, which is looking at tools and maintenance. At the end of this part of the session, I want you all to be able to recognise and state the name of five different tools, explain the use of five different tools, and describe the basic maintenance requirements of tools. So general information about maintenance, um, we need to keep our tools in good condition. Um, and part of doing that would, would be include things like cleaning them, oiling them, and replacing damaged parts. Any tool with a blade, be it a cutting wheel or, or a more traditional blade, will need to have the blade replaced periodically as it becomes old and gets blunt. All metal tools with moving parts will require to be lubricated periodically to allow them to keep moving freely. First tool we're going to look at are pipe cutters. There's lots of different types of pipe cutters. One we can see up here in the top right is a pipe slice. Uh, we can only use that for cutting specific sizes of copper, this particular one. It's got a, a wheel inside there, a cutting wheel, which periodically will need to be replaced if it becomes chipped or damaged. Here we've got adjustable pipe cutters. The bottom one here you'd use with, with copper, and the top one here you'd use with steel. And this is the cutting wheel, uh, which would need to be replaced if it becomes blunt or chipped. You check that before you use the tool to check it's in good condition. Now, using a pipe cutter, it's straightforward enough. Make sure that you put the pipe cutter flush on the pipe. If it's an adjustable one, you tighten it until it's just lightly gripping the pipe. And then you turn it a few times um, to, to get a nice groove. Tighten it a little bit, turn it a few times again. Make sure that it's sitting squarely on the pipe so it doesn't spiral up the pipe. You might have seen that in, in practical. Okay. Important thing to remember, whenever you cut any pipe, really, you should always deburr it. The only time that you're, you're not really going to have to do it is if you use a plastic pipe cutter to cut plastic pipe that doesn't leave a, a ream or a burr. Um, but any other pipe, any other time you cut it, you should always deburr it straight afterwards. And you can see um, the deburring taking place up in the top right here. There's another tool for it, uh, a specific tool for it just here on the, on the bottom right. So plastic pipe cutters, uh, again, there's various tools used for, for cutting uh, plastic pipe. This one here is, is a plastic pipe cutter. And this one here is a plastic pipe slice. Um, the sort of key difference between a plastic pipe slice and, and the more traditional pipe slice for cutting copper is that plastic pipe slice has actually got a blade, more like a Stanley knife in there, um, whereas the, the more traditional one has a, a cutting wheel. So on the, right, on the left hand side, we have the plastic pipe cutter on the right hand side, plastic pipe slice. Again, they, these have got replaceable blades like you can see. Hacksaws, hacksaws also have replaceable blades. Um, we generally use them for cutting, say for example, metal pipe and some plastic pipes, not all plastic pipes, and we'll get onto that in, in, a, in a different module. Uh, the type of blade, uh, basically the number of teeth per inch, would vary depending on the material. But whichever blade we put in, we should always make sure that it's fitted under tension. We keep the, the blade under tension and the teeth should be facing forward, should be facing away from you as, the, as you make that cut. Uh, there's also, as well as a, a sort of big hacksaw, there's also a junior hacksaw, which is a smaller version of, of the big hacksaw. Okay. Water pump pliers, use, very useful tool. Uh, I always used to call them grips, but the proper name for them are water pump pliers. You can see them just here. Um, and yeah, they're essentially used for gripping pipe or tightening fittings normally. Okay. Uh, probably won't come up in the test, but if you are going to be tightening up, say, for example, compression fittings, you're probably better off using a pair of spanners rather than a water pump pliers because the water pump pliers, um, they can damage the, 
the fittings if you're not really, really careful with them. Because they've got these, the teeth on them will, will, will sort of grind away, eat away at the, at the metal. Uh, so spanners, lots of different types of spanners. One we'll made often probably is the adjustable one because you can adjust it. It fits all sorts of different numbers of fittings. But <clears throat> I have a slight preference um, if, I, if I've got the choice of, of using a, a regular sort of open-ended spanner like the one you can see up in the top right there. Uh, just because it doesn't move, you know, once you once you, it's with the adjustable, sometimes it can it can slip a bit as you as you're tightening it, which means it can slip off. Uh, I prefer using the open-ended spanner. It's quite a useful bit of kit. Uh, ring spanners are also can can be useful, but but not really for tightening up fittings because you can't get them onto the pipe. If if, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, basin spanners, uh, also known as tap spanners, basin wrenches, look look like this. So they look, so they can look really quite quite dissimilar from from one another, but they all do the same job. And basically, what we use them for is mainly for tightening up uh, fittings onto taps, but we can also use them for fitting the taps themselves onto basins and and whatnot. Bash. Footprints. Another useful bit of kit, and um, they they are a form of pipe wrench. And this is what they look like: footprints. And we we can use them for gripping pipe, tightening fittings. Stilsons. Stilsons are another type of pipe wrench. Uh, just a much. They do the same thing as the footprints. Are just a much bigger sort of version. So you can see stilsons. These things here. Bending machines, lots of different types of bending machines depending on what you want to bend. Up on the top right uh, here we've got a, a scissor bender. We can use that for bending the 15 and 22 mil copper. Um, here we have a stand bender uh, which we can use for, for bending pipes up to 40 mil. And also we can use it for bending light gauge steel pipe. Uh, like for example the, the electricians use them for bending light gauge steel pipe uh, when they're using it for their conduit. Okay. Uh, when it when it comes to the medium and heavy gauge steel pipe, the stuff that we'd actually use in, in, as plumbers, we'd have to use a hydraulic bending machine, which is like this one on the bottom right just here, because it's longer and much harder to bend. Um, on another note, when it comes to uh, bending copper, there's also these very small bending machines, which um, we can we sometimes might use for bending microbore. Though generally speaking, we can bend the microbore with our hands, but if we want it to look particularly neat or we've got a particularly sharp bend we, we need to make um, and we don't want to use fittings, then we can use one of these, one of these microbore bending machines, which we'll see in our, in our test. Okay, uh, threading machines. Again, kind of going back to steel pipe, um, we, we will need to put threads onto the pipe. Okay, so threading machines, uh, there's a two different types. One is stocks and dies, which are these ones here up in the top right. Um, they're the ones that you guys are, are going to use in the workshop. But you also might come across electric threading machines as well. Very useful bit of kit. Really speeds up the job if you're if you're working with the steel pipe on site. Um, and the purpose of both is, to, is the same. It's to cut the threads on the steel pipe, like you can see uh, in the picture on the bottom right here. And you can see the threads have been cut onto the pipe, which then would allow it to be a, a threaded fitting to be screwed onto the end of it. So you need to use BTFE, which we're going to chat about in the next, uh, later on in, in this session. Claw hammer. Uh, claw hammer is what most people would just call a hammer, um, essentially. Uh, but it's, it's a claw hammer because it's got a sort of claw on the back end of it, which can be used for removing nails that you can see just here. So claw hammer we use for hammering and, and removing nails. Okay, lump hammer. Uh, it's like this this big chunky thing here. Okay, um, big heavy hammer. We normally use it with either a cold chisel or a bolster, um, and that's for sort of knocking holes in, in through concrete and stuff. The the cold chisel we'd probably use it for knocking knocking holes through concrete and block. Uh, the, the bolster we might use for for sort of cutting chases or for potentially even for sort of um, splitting the, 
Um, splitting floorboards, if you if you need to lift a floorboard you and you want to split the feather edge, you might use a bolster for that, though I wouldn't recommend it personally. Uh, one thing to know about with, with these types of tools is with a cold chisel and with a bolster, if you use them regularly over a long period, they can end up with something called a mushroomed head. And you can see that on the left hand side here. These have been hit so often with this big heavy lump hammer that the end of the steel has actually started to turn over on itself. And that's what we describe as a mushroomed head. Um, this can be dangerous because if you if you continue to keep hitting it, like particles can fly off and, and could, could hurt your eyes. Um, so what we should do, if we do get a tool with a mushroom head, if it starts to become mushroom, then just grind it off, you know, get an angle grinder and um, safely set it up and, and grind off the, the, the mushroom head. Cutting chasers, very, very briefly going to look at cutting chasers, OK, what just so we know what they are, really. Um, a chase is a channel which has been cut into into brick or block or sometimes even into, into concrete floors. Um, and there's maximum depths that we can uh, cut these chases to, depending on whether it's horizontal or vertical. OK, if you've got a horizontal chase when it's going along the way horizontally, you can cut no more than one sixth of the depth of the block. So the depth of the block divided by six. Um, if you're going vertically, you could cut no more than one third of the depth of the block. And then this will come up in your test, uh, most likely. I'm going to sort of cover it in a later module as well. OK, so normally to create a chase, you'd cut along the edges with an angle grinder and then you'd sort of knock out the middle bit with a with a bolster or a cold or a cold chisel. Excuse me. OK. Uh, yeah, make sure the chases don't exceed the maximum depth shown. Sledgehammer. Um, people often get this mixed up with a lump hammer, but a sledgehammer's got a much longer handle. Um, and generally it's got a heavier head as well. And you use a sledgehammer more often than not for demolition. Things like knocking down walls. OK. Briefly going to look at power tools now. OK. Um, we've looked at, at sort of how to safely use um, these in, in the safety module already, but we're going to briefly recap on this because they might ask about it again. OK, so for the power tools, always check the tool for damage before use. You remember from the safety module, check the cable, check check near the tool itself, check check on the plug, um, check for damage, check it's clean, check it's in good condition. If it's not, uh, then don't use it. Tell your supervisor, get another one. OK. If it's a corded power tool, it has to be pack tested. Uh, if that's on a building site, it needs to be pack tested every three months. If it's been used in a domestic premises, it needs to be pack tested every 12 months. Um, but for our battery tools, they don't need to be pack tested. Only the uh, battery charger would need to be pack tested. OK. Brief look at electric drills. Um, yeah, battery drills we normally use for lighter work, putting in screws, drilling small holes. Um, for corded tools, we might use for cutting bigger holes alongside the, the appropriately sized core cutter. Electric saws, um, can you look briefly at these? Jigsaw, this is one at the top right, you'd use for sort of cutting shapes, for example, out of a, out of a kitchen worktop, or a circular saw like the one we've got shown in the bottom right here, which we'd use for, for sort of cutting, cutting wood, basically. You might use it for lifting floors, um, cut, cutting along the, the sort of feathered edge um, in, the, in the tongue and groove, which I'm going to talk about with you guys in the next module. OK. And OK, right, now it's time for your task.